Dobo Bos Halavat, it is my pleasure to be here today. My name is Jane Lacovara. Today I'm going to talk to you about infection prevention management. And the learning objectives for this lecture are we're going to discuss why people with cancer are at higher risk for infection. We're going to identify key signs and symptoms of infection and sepsis. We're going to outline evidence-based evaluation and treatment for people with infection and sepsis. And lastly, we're going to discuss um, so that you develop an understanding of the need for rapid nursing assessment and intervention for people with signs and symptoms of infection and sepsis. So one of the things that we do as nurses in the United States is we teach our patients all the time. We advocate for our patients by teaching them about their disease. And you don't have to have a specific time to teach your patients. Every time you go see your patient to give them medication or to administer something for nursing, this is a good time that you can use to, to spend talking to your patient and teaching them. So cancer patients are immunosuppressed. What does that mean? It means they have a weakened immune system. And the most important thing we can do to help them is to wash our hands many times. And the most important thing that the patients can do is wash their hands. The other thing that we take, teach our patients about being immunosuppressed is that they should avoid meat, fish, or eggs that are not well cooked because that can cause salmonella. We tell them to stay away from dirt and plants because there's many funguses that grow in the dirt. We tell them to avoid crowds. We tell them to stay clean by bathing every single day. Bathing is very, very important. The reason bathing is important is because if we reduce the bacteria count on our skin, we're going to be reducing the patient's risk for infection. Remember, the skin is the largest organ in our body, and it is also our first line of immunity. So another thing that we focus on in the United States on cancer patients when they're immunosuppressed is by providing vaccinations. Vaccinations can prevent secondary infectious diseases such as influenza. However, many cancer patients are not to have live vaccines. There are also vaccines that prevent cancer, such as the HPV vaccine and hepatitis. For example, we know that the HPV vaccine could prevent up to 70% of cervical cancer just by getting this vaccine. The vaccine is prevention for cancer. We also know that the hepatitis vaccine also can prevent liver cancer than it can occur from hepatitis B. So one of the things that I'm sure you've seen in a very sick cancer patient is febrile neutropenia. And yesterday, when we visited the Petroff Institute, we looked at your patients, and we know that you experienced this, and we also see how well you're treating this and looking out for this. What is febrile neutropenia? It is a fever that occurs simultaneously along with low neutrophils or low white blood counts. And we know that this increases the patient's risk of infection. Specifically, we look for fevers of greater than 38 degrees centigrade, sometimes coughing or a sore throat, chills or fevers, a stiff or sore neck, skin rashes, urine that is bloody and cloudy, and um, an absolute neutrophil count less than 1,500. 
Those are all signs or symptoms that the patient may be developing febrile neutropenia. So who is at risk for febrile neutropenia? Most frequently, it's chemotherapy patients or bone marrow patients, specifically ones seven to 12 days after their treatment. That's the highest risk of febrile neutropenia. With a febrile neutropenia, a very minor infection can become deadly or lethal. So we also know that hematologic cancers and bone marrow transplant patients are the most at risk of febrile neutropenia. But we also know that it still occurs in solid organ cancers. So in neutropenia, there's different grades. But we get very concerned when the absolute neutrophil count, the WBC count, goes less than 1,500. Severe neutropenia is when it's less than 500. And you can calculate the absolute neutrophil count yourself. You don't need a lab to do it. There are ways to do it. So what is a good way to prevent febrile neutropenia, the first line of defense, as I said before, is hand hygiene, washing your hands. Every single time you go see that patient, wash your hands before you go in the room. Another way to prevent febrile neutropenia is by administering colony stimulating factors. Another way is to administer antibiotics. So patients that are at risk, more at risk of developing febrile neutropenia are patients that have underlying disease processes going on besides their cancer, such as liver, lung, or kidney disease. They can affect tolerance. We also know that performance status or performance factor in the patient, the underlying mobility issues in patients can affect whether or not they're at risk for febrile neutropenia. And we always use infectious disease consults. Is that something that you use here? Infectious disease consults, yeah. So what we do is we administer colony stimulating factors for patients that are greater than 20% at risk. And again, the colony stimulating factors are substances that produce that stimulate the production of blood cells in the bone marrow, liver, and the kidneys. Our body produces our own colony stimulating factors, but immunosuppressed cancer patients are unable to produce their own colony stimulating factors. So we can provide them externally um, through the skin on a body injection system. Patients that are very much at risk of having low colony stimulating factors are patients that have hemopoietic recovery from either chemotherapy or radiation therapy because both of those greatly affect bone marrow. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about infection prevention and in surgical patients. One of the things, we did a study at the University of Arizona, and what we realized was that we were not doing these things that were helpful in preventing surgical site infections after surgery in cancer patients. The first thing you wanna do is keep the blood glucose less than 180. So tight blood glucose control is tied to reduced surgical site infections. We also stopped all antibiotics within 24 hours of starting them. And we also learned that leaving the original operating room dressing in sight for 48 hours without moving that original dressing is very, very important because that dressing is applied in the operating room in a sterile condition. So what we do is if the dressing from surgery is leaking or there's exudate, we reinforce with dressings on top of the original operating room dressing. We do not disturb that dressing for 48 hours. 
After that, you can take it off and change it. So the reason we knew we had a problem was we as nurses started collecting data on our patients. We saw that we weren't controlling the blood sugar as well as we should have. We also noticed that the doctors sometimes were going into the room, taking a peek, removing the dressing, looking at the surgical site in that less than 48 hours. And so we started guarding our patients and said, we're going to keep the blood sugars under control and we're not going to let anybody peek under that dressing for 48 hours. And we were able to reduce our surgical site infection dramatically. So I understand you do a lot of colorectal uh, cancer surgery here in Russia. And one of the things that we had problems with as nurses was isolating the colostomy or the ileostomy from the midline incision. And you can see in this picture that I took, what we do is we take the ostomy appliance and we move it over. So the stoma does not have to be right in the middle of the ostomy appliance. The stoma can be over in the side. So in this picture, I'm, I cut the stoma way over, and then we also cut the midline incision dressing so you see that they do not come in, in contact with each other. This is another way of reducing surgical site infections that nurses can do by keeping those two wounds isolated separately. It's particularly challenging as a nurse to care for a patient like this if the stoma is very close to the midline incision. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about one major risk for cancer patients and how they end up getting infected, and that is central lines. We visited the Petrov Center. We see that you don't use ports. You use a lot of central lines. We do as well. So one thing that's really important is that you wash your hands before you actually put on the sterile gloves. We did a study on this where we collected data, and what we saw was our doctors and nurses were putting sterile gloves on, but they weren't washing their hands first. That's actually the first step before you put gloves on is to wash your hands. We also use chloroprep for site cleaning. Chloroprep is a combination of chlorhexidine plus alcohol. We scrub for 30 seconds and we allow it to dry for 30 seconds. The dry time is as important as the cleaning time. The dressings must always be occlusive, clean, dry, intact. And I saw the dressings yesterday at your hospital, and they looked beautiful. We also want to make sure that all, all ends of our, our different lines all have caps on them when they're not in use. So again, I'm coming back to a similar thing. I keep telling you, we need to wash our hands. The patients need to wash our hands. The patients need to wash every single day. We have found that if we encourage daily bathing with chlorhexidine, again, by reducing the bacteria count on the skin, we're reducing the patient's risk for a central line infection. We scrub the access port or hub with a lot of friction um, and using an antiseptic. We only use sterile devices to access the catheter. Um, if, the, if the dressing that you have on your central line, if you only have um, gauze, the gauze has to be changed every two days. We saw yesterday at the Petrov Center that you use semi-permeable membranes, and those are good for seven days. But if you live in a part of Russia where you do not have these semi-permeable membranes and you only have gauze, it is fine to use gauze. You just want to move them, change the gauze every two days. And we've also found that providing a checklist 
for both nurses and doctors helps us keep these quality things in mind because when the patient is very sick and we're hurrying, it's easy for us to skip one of these steps. So one of the things we need to do as nurses is advocate for our patients. And so we always need to be wary of things that we see that are not good for our patients. So what we've done in the United States is during central line insertions, if we see that the physician breaks the sterile technique, we have the authority to stop the insertion and ask the physician to restart using sterile technique. By the same idea, if you work with a nurse that you see is not using good aseptic technique, you need to say something. You need to advocate for your patient because as nurses, one of our biggest jobs is advocating for our patients. So again, um, these are pictures I took at the university. Um, our dressings are kept clean, dry, and intact. And if you notice, there's a little round patch at the insertion site. I, didn't, I did not notice these yesterday in your institution, but they're easy to use. They're basically little tiny antimicrobial patches that go right at the entrance to the um, central line. They have chlorhexidine on them and they reduce the incidence of infection right at the insertion site. So now we're going to do a little bit of role play. I'm not sure how this is going to play here, but what I want you to do is turn to the person next to you and I want you to talk to the nurse that's sitting next to you and tell the nurse that you've observed poor infection control and that you'd like them to take better care of their patients. So I'm going to give you a few minutes. I don't know how this plays out. So now that we talked about the patient is immunosuppressed and all these risks that they have, we're going to move to a different topic, which is sepsis. And what we know is that many cancer patients actually do not die of cancer. They die of sepsis. But we have a tendency to say, my patient died of cancer, when actually the patient did not die of cancer. They died of sepsis. So that's what we're going to talk about next. In the United States, it is the leading cause of death in the hospital, is sepsis. It's the tenth leading cause of death worldwide. The incidence is getting worse. It's continuing to grow. It's not getting better. And it's growing at approximately 1.5% per year. Not only is sepsis lethal, but it also costs a lot. It increases ICU expenditures by 40%. What we also know is that an evidence-based systematic approach to sepsis can reduce both morbidity and mortality. And this science is not new. It's about 10 to 12 years old. So what is sepsis? Sepsis is actually a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host. So in other words, the body has an inflammatory response with sepsis where it starts attacking itself and attacking its own organs. Sepsis has the highest mortality rate of any admitting diagnosis, and 30% of the patients 
that get admitted to the hospital with sepsis are going to die. That is a very high mortality rate. So I mentioned that sepsis is an inflammatory response. And with sepsis, it starts out simple, but then it can quickly deteriorate. So these are some of the signs of initial inflammation in the body. Two or more of these symptoms, a temperature greater than 38 degrees or hypothermia, less than 36 degrees, a heart rate greater than 90, respiratory rate greater than 20, or a low PCO2 rate, which means the body is blowing off carbon dioxide, an elevated white count, or a low white count. Sometimes what I see in patients is before the white count moves, their platelets will actually drop. So sometimes the, one of the first indications is a drop in platelets before the WBC actually changes. So the first slide that I showed you about all those symptoms, that's helpful, but it's not too sensitive, right? Because if we run to catch a bus, we're going to have those symptoms. So what um, the ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncologists, and the European Society of Clinical Oncologists came up with is a quick SOFA scale. Three things. It's very simple. And if you think about this, this patient may not look that sick, but it's a heart, heart rate, I'm sorry, respiratory rate greater than 22. That's not bad, right? We've seen our patients go up respiratory rates in their 40s, but a respiratory rate greater than 22 is a problem. A change in the patient's level of consciousness. So any kind of an altered mentation and then a systolic blood pressure less than or equal to 100 millimeters of mercury. So this quick diagnostic set of these three things, these are things you as nurses can look for and notify your physicians right away. So I talked about how deadly sepsis is but now I want to talk about how important time is when it comes to treating sepsis. Time is everything. We know from many studies that the speed and the appropriateness of the way in which we respond to sepsis in the first few hours will greatly influence the outcome of the patient. So once you've identified your patient as septic, you need to start the clock right now. And within the next three to six hours, you need to do a lot. And time is everything. So the science, as I said, behind this, all the studies that support this is not new. This is pretty old stuff. But we do know that the science behind the elements of what I'm going to teach you are so well established that implementation should be considered general acceptable practice everywhere around the world. So for the first three hours, once you've identified that your patient is septic, the first three hours are essential. And the clock stops once you identify, it starts, excuse me, once you identify that the patient is septic. The first thing you do is notify your physicians. And there's no reason nurses can't pick up on the sepsis before the doctors do. You have good assessment skills. So if you think your patient is septic, tell your doctor, I'm afraid, I think my patient's septic. Measure the lactic acid. This is really simple. It's a simple blood test, and it helps you diagnose. Obtain blood cultures right away. 
It's important that you get the blood cultures prior to giving antibiotics. You get at least two blood cultures. If a patient has a central line, you can take one from there, but you have to take the second blood culture from somewhere else because the line may be infected rather than the blood. Once you draw the culture, then you start broad spectrum antibiotics right away. You don't wait. This is all within three hours. And then lastly, within three hours, you administer 30 cc's per kilogram of crystalloid. Crystalloid is normal saline or lactated ringers. You do this for low blood pressure or elevated lactate. So within three hours, you do three things. Get the lactate level, draw the blood cultures, and start antibiotics right away. This isn't advancing. But it's not advancing. Can you just go to the next slide? Then the next thing we do within six hours, it's perfect. Within six hours, so again, within three hours, time is against you. You need to work really hard right away. Within six hours, you want to remeasure the lactate if the first one came back greater than two. So if your lactate is greater than two, you need to assume the patient's septic. What you'll see many times is when you give them fluid, the lactate will come down. So within the three hour time, you've drawn the lactate, the lactate comes back, it's greater than two. Now we're thinking the patient really may be septic. So within six hours, you're gonna remeasure that lactate you're going to provide vasopressors. Vasopressors are um, drugs that uh, drugs that constrict the venous system and the arterial system. So, for example, um, norepinephrine, um, dopamine. Are these drugs that you use? Yeah. Okay. So. You want to get them started on these drugs right away because they su support the circula circulation system. And what happens in sepsis is the circulation system collapses. So by providing pressors, you're supporting the circulation system. If the patient continues to be hypotensive or have low blood pressure, despite the fact that you've given them fluid, and you've given them pressors, you want to continue to do that. So if you noticed on the three-hour thing, I said 30 cc's per kilogram. That's the fluid resuscitation. Does that come out to be 1,000 cc's or 500 cc's? No. Nobody's a perfect 500 or 1,000. And what we were looking at our own nursing practice in the United States is we saw that when someone was hypotensive, we were giving them a liter of fluid because that's what was available. That's what the doctors were ordering. But actually, that's not the 30 cc's per kilogram. So if you see that somebody gets 500 or 1,000, you know they're not getting the correct treatment. So what I want you to start thinking of, again, is that your patient who's immunosuppressed did not die of cancer. They died of sepsis. And it's OK to say that. It's OK to say that to each other. It's OK to start talking that way. But what I find is that people just say, oh, they died of cancer, when we know that a very large percentage of them actually did not die of the cancer. They died of sepsis, it could have been treated, and we didn't treat it aggressively enough. So this is a man that you probably don't recognize. I actually looked for a picture of a Russian patient, maybe, who died of cancer, but I couldn't find one. 
But this person is Paul Allen. If you've ever heard of the company Microsoft, he was the co-founder. He and Bill Gates were college buddies. They, they founded Microsoft. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. Wealthy, owner of the Seattle Seahawks. He had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Do you want to know what he died of? Guess. Guess what Paul Allen died of? Sepsis. He didn't die of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He died of sepsis. And I want you to understand that nurses have the capacity to make a difference, both clinically and system-wide, in the sepsis mortality rates at your facilities. Sepsis is an emergency. We want to advocate for our patients. Time is of the essence. You can make a difference. Nurses can make a difference. Again, this is the end of my talk. We discussed why people like with cancer are more at risk for infection. We also discussed um, signs and symptoms of infection and sepsis. We talked about understanding the need for time. A rapid assessment and rapid treatment of the sepsis is of the essence. Spasiba. Questions, dear colleagues. Into the mic, please. Thank you so much, Jane, for a very interesting presentation. I am very thankful to all foreign speakers for coming here. I am Serebrenikova Natalia, the Association of the Russian Nurses. We have the experience of cooperating with the American Society of Oncological Nurses. It was a very good project in 2013, 2014. At that time, Sorry. <laughs> I am Serebrenikova Natalia, the Association of uh, Russian nurses. I am representing the Association of uh, Nurses of Russia. In 2013-2014, we had uh, the project of cooperation with the American Oncological Society. At that time, we started to think how uh, we could extend the authority of oncological nurses. We knew from you today we have how a nurse can see the first symptoms of a severe complications. In Russia, uh, probably the largest thing that a nurse can do, just call for a doctor, saying the doctor, I suspect uh, this kind of uh, uh, complication. But what's happening in your country? If a nurse uh, sees a patient and she suspected neutropenia, what's your actions? What's the algorithm of action? Excellent question. We nurses in the United States have exactly the same problem. We need to talk to our physicians to get the treatment that we want for our patients. But don't hesitate to speak up to the physician and advocate for your patient. If you have the signs and symptoms, and if you contact the physician and you say, I believe my patient is septic, and this is why, and you name all the things, you've done the best thing you can as a nurse, right? It's up to the physician to order the treatment. But we have issues, we have similar issues in the United States. And when we visited the Petrov Institute, we were so impressed with what you guys do. Just incredible, incredible. Making chemotherapy, it's like, that's amazing. You guys are doing a lot. And it is a cultural change. But I would like to coach you 
into talking to your physicians and asking for treatment that you know is right. If you're an experienced nurse, you may know the best thing for that patient. You want to communicate to the physician in a way that's going to be very respectful and recognize that the decision is up to them to make that decision. But there's no reason you can't name all the reasons why you feel a certain way. Okay? That's an excellent question. And we have the same problem in the United States. Uh, Jean, can to this, uh, maybe a point of view for Europe from what we do in Belgium. Uh, for a long time ago, we had the same problem that we didn't know what to do with patients. We thought it was septic and we have to call to the doctor. But the, I think the main important thing is like implement standards of care so that you nurses know if you suspect that the patient is going to sepsis or have an infer have an, a severe infection, you can already start with assessing the patient and taking vital, the vital signs. Also start with taking blood counts you can do. Also taking cultures of if there are any wounds with the patient. And then you have a good talk and calling to the doctor like, this is the assessment at this moment with your patients. What are the next actions? What do you want administrating at this moment? Do you want to start antibiotics or do you want to start fluently? So that's the thing you can start with. Taking good and making good like like agreements with physicians, like making standards of care. Thank you, Johan. That's exactly right. If you get that lactate level, you know it's elevated. The patient's had a change in their mental status, and their blood pressure is borderline. You've got a good story right there. Once you get that lactate level, that helps a lot. The problem with lactate is there are other things that can elevate the lactate, such as cardiogenic shock or hypovolemic shock, but um, it's one indication, and it's a very good indication. Jane, thank you very much for your representation. I'm a nurse of National uh, Research uh, Clinic named after Vishnevsky, Moscow, and I have a question. How do you carry on the prevention of such a complication as a pressure ulcers? So the prevention for pressure ulcers and when they indicate isotonics despite the desire of the nurse, when they indicate vasotonics within 8 to 20 hours, because we can have those pressure ulcers within 8 to 20 hours, what do you do with them? Thank you. You are absolutely right. There are some patients that will develop skin breakdown very fast. It used to be that we thought patients all develop skin pressure because we didn't turn them enough or we didn't move them enough. What we now know is that there are certain patients that no matter what you do, they're going to develop skin breakdown. There is a great professional organization. It's called the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel. NUA, I don't know, you can Google it, National Pressure Ulcery Advisor Panel. And they've come up, they're a list of experts, and they've come up with certain indications that they know. So, example, patients that are on blood thinners, patients that have low blood pressure, there are certain indications that we know those patients no matter what you do, are going to develop skin breakdown. Remember, the skin is the largest organ in our body. If you have a patient that develops lung failure, kidney failure, heart failure, and liver failure, do you think the skin's going to be fine? The skin's another organ. The skin's going to break down like everything else. So it's important to turn the patient, get the patient up, move the patient as much as you can, but I'm sure with your experience, you've also met patients that you turn them on their side and their blood pressure drops to 50. OK? 
okay? You gotta keep a good blood pressure before you can turn them. So thanks for your work and keep going at it. It's hard work. Thank you. Are there any questions? So I've got something to add. Thank you very much for your, represent, uh, for your presentation. I would like uh, to uh, talk from the f physician. So I'm a physician, and the subject topic is So the topic of sepsis of, uh, in the febrile neutropenia is very, very actual fast. So we measure the temperature uh, in the armpit uh, area. So in the USA, I know that you measure the temperature in oral cavity or the rectal temperature. And it's more to the nuclear temperature. So we need to pay attention to the patients whose uh, temperature and axillary area is uh, higher than 37 and, and 5. So the nurse should pay special attention to such a patient, especially if this patient has uh, chills, because uh, usually uh, further due to this heat in this armpit area, uh, even after indication of antipyretics, uh, the temperature goes up. So we may say that this temperature and chill is uh, shows the episode of uh, febrile neutropenia. And the second moment is, once again, it's mandatory to measure the arterial pressure pulse. And uh, mostly important is to tell the doctor, and usually the mental uh, alterations, and as for sofa, so you've, you've mentioned quick sofa. Uh, not everyone understood what you're talking about. Sofa uh, scale is, it relates to se sepsis. It's the dysfunction of organs and systems. It's quite complicated. If we're talking about uh, the usual scale, it's the prerogative of the physician. But quick sofa usually helps the nurse to assess the patient who needs uh, physician's control to pay attention of to notify the physician that the patient needs his control, that he's got some uh, some bad pressure, that some he has some uh, mental alteration, so his respiratory rate is a little bit not normal. So you need to pay special attention to this patient because we need uh, to introduce this sofa, quick sofa scale, not only in the departments. In, uh, not only in hematological departments, not only in surgical uh, uh, departments, but also in all departments. So thank you very much. Thank you. That's excellent. You've got it down exactly. And thank you for pointing out, I was referring to rectal temperatures or temperatures through Foley catheters or temperatures through the esophagus. So you're exactly right. An axillary temperature may be two degrees lower. Thank you. Uh, Jane. Jane, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your the most interesting uh, presentation. I have such a naive question, especially compared to the other. I've got a port system question. So everywhere you paid attention that port system is quite rare in patients in Russia, right? Так у меня English. Jane, do you hear me now? Do you hear me? So the question is the following, uh, quite naive. 
uh, we are discussing uh, on different levels and also with some uh, monitor organs what gloves we should use uh, working with port system and how often we need to wash port system if we haven't used it for a long period of time. There's no, <coughs> there's no question that's not a good question. The fact that you're willing to ask a question is the most important thing. So when we access ports, we access ports with masks and sterile gloves. Um, and our ports, we say they need to be flushed every 30 days. That is if someone's not receiving something. So if someone goes home with a port, the patient has to get that port flushed at least every 30 days. Was that what you were asking or? Yes, thank you. That's my, that was my question. Thank you very much. Because we are discussing this topic. Somebody say it's one per month, one per month and a half, and some say even once per half a year. And the second question, what gloves you work in using ports when the port is already inserted? So when you change the needle, when you do all the manipulations, what gloves do you use? We use sterile gloves. And I am happy to send you our guidelines for um, long-term care of ports. Just remind me, Irina, when I get back, I'll email you our guidelines. And I think you've been doing translating. I, I was able to get some documents translated, so I'll send you our guidelines and to your uh, Petrov Inst Institute, and you can have someone translate them for you. We've got one more minute. Thank you very much. We will be very thankful to you. Uh, another addition about port systems. So, so uh, I work with port systems in our inpatient uh, clinic. We've got special guidelines on flashing port systems uh, as a such, a such a checklist. And for nurses, we've got information as such, such as. So it's very important not only to do it frequently, but also to use special solution for it. And if we talk about flashing port system when it is not in use, uh, in those breaks between chemotherapies and uh, just monitoring the, uh, the patient in remission. So the period can be up to three months is in the situation when we use specialized solutions. So for example, based on terolazine, if we talk about a normal saline, I, I'm sure you don't use a uh, hypolysine uh, solution, hyperizine, hyperizine solution for a long period of time. Hyperine, oh, hyperine solution. You don't use it, right? We don't. Um, we used to use heparin that we instilled into the ports, but we don't do that anymore. We just use normal saline. Yeah. Um, and I would like to invite you. Clearly, this is a topic that you know a lot about. Is there a way that you could send your guidelines to all the nurses in this room? And by email, maybe? Is there, is there a way to do that? Do, you regi do people register with their email? So um, I would invite you to share the guidelines that you've developed at your facility with all the nurses in Russia. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So the idea is that in any institution uh, where you work, you need to have special protocol on using this or that uh, a prolonged uh, vascular access device. Because it's the thing that here in Russia we have uh, just in developing. Because financial sources of our 
Russia in um, medical services are quite uh, low. They are quite restricted. Not every patient is able to get this service for free. And uh, including our inpatient clinic, it is still uh, you, you pay for it. Yes, yeah, sure. I, I'm very sorry I don't hear the question. Uh, I know it that in some regions there is the standard of uh, medical health provision, but I'm glad to see that people come with those devices of prolonged uh, vascular uh, access. And when I see it in inpatient clinics, and I can see that it was installed not in our clinic, and I asked the patient where he had uh, this device installed, and he says that it was installed in our region, it was for free. It was, it, it's a very, very good tendency, but uh, it's, it's uh, under development in our country. So we will have special session dedicated to prolonged access devices in 10th uh, in hall in uh, 1230. So thank you. Another prolonged vas vascular access device would be uh, lines for patients that are getting dialyzed kidney uh, failure patients. That's another long-term venous access. Okay. This concludes my talk. Um, uh, thank you very much. Spasibo.